Hello, everyone, and thank Hi. you for attending the show tonight. Um, we're all here backstage. We're going to have a great panel discussion. Thank you for the film. It was amazing. Just so much energy, and I learned so much. I'm going to introduce everyone, and then I'm going to pose a few questions. And um, if we have time, we'll answer questions from the audience. And then you guys can just do your thing. I know you guys are all old friends, so... <laughs> So tonight, obviously, you know, I'm Okenji. Uh, tonight we've got the honor of uh, Dr. Godfrey Dunn, who's an author, filmmaker, and award-winning investigative reporter with 40 years of experience in journalism. He's a senior correspondent for Metro newspapers in California and a regular contributor to the San Francisco Chronicle and the Huffington Post. He is also the director of Calypso Dreams. We also have Professor Alvin Daniel, who is a co-producer on the film. He's a composer, TV personality, and engineer. And we've also got uh, David Michael Rudder, who is an iconic figure in Calypso music. He's been compared to Fela, you know, what Fela is in Nigeria or Marley is in Jamaica. This is David Runner to uh, Rudder to Trinidad and Tobago. So we're so honored to have him. And we're also here with my friend, Sandra A.M. Bell, uh, head of the Juve Fest Collective, and I'm sure she could tell you a lot more about the wonderful program that she does. So I'm, I'm so honored to be here and thank you, everyone. Okay. Well, just a brief um, description because I want the, the gentleman to speak mostly. Uh, Juve Fest is a collective of Something Positive Inc., the premier performing arts um, uh, company in the USA, Caribbean, and um, also Pagua Mass, which is the number one Juve band here in Brooklyn, and I guess in the USA as well, and a, a flu of different um, steel band uh, um, players and rhythm section guys, you know, they come and go. So we got together and we formed Juve Fest because we want to take Juve to the world because Juve has its own story, its own music, its own characters, its own personality, and it is the genesis of Carnival in the Caribbean. So our mission is to, to present and preserve what is the original style Trinbago Juve, spelled J apostrophe O-U-V-E-R-T, meaning opening of the day, O-I, opening in French. So, I just want to say that this is our mission and this is our way to keep connected with the community because we we can't be out in the street performing, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a way for us to stay connected and to help the public understand what Carnival is about, what Juve is about, what Calypso is about, what Steel Man is about. That's our mission. Uh, until we are no more, this is what we're going to be doing. And so I am happy to join with Ogechi and the Sabera Cole Film Festival and the City of Asylum to present this. We have two more uh, films to go, one in February, one in March, and then hopefully we can take it out to the street. We don't know, let's see what COVID says. All right, so you can take it from there. Excellent, excellent, thank you uh, for that. So, um, you know, I have some questions. You know, like I say, I'm a, a tourist in your culture. You know, Sabira, everyone knows this, it was my aunt. I received my cultural education from her. And now it seems that that cultural education is continuing even now. So, you know, I'm, I'm just floored because I had a totally different view of what Calypso music was. And that was something that was touched on in the film because obviously, you know, I know Harry Belafonte shakes Sonora and that's my Calypso education, but through my friendship with Sandra, I've, I've learned so much. And I just want to talk to you, uh, Godfrey and uh, Professor Daniel, Dr. Dunn, about what uh, made you guys make this film and the timing that you guys made this film. What made you understand the urgency of the film? And then the fact that you guys made it in three years, which is pretty record for a documentary. That's actually pretty good time. <laughs> well, not quite. Let me say, like you, it's interesting. I grew up in an Italian fishing family in California, and it was first generation, meaning my grandparents and mother were born in Italy and had come and migrated here. 
So it was perceived as a foreign culture at that time in U.S. culture. And wouldn't you know, it, one of my aunts just loved Belafonte and introduced me to Calypso as a little boy through there. Then I had a dear friend, Michael Horn, who began going to Trinidad in the 1980s with another friend, Danny Bicker. And they were coming back with these stories. Um, and to be quite honest, one of the stories was the night that David Rudder was crowned king uh, in the 1980s. And they brought me back all these tapes and uh, articles and film. And I fell in love with the music and the story. And as a filmmaker, I tried to raise some money to produce the film. Never really were able to raise any because people really were clueless about that concept of Calypso and the reality of Calypso in Trinidad. So I actually, as Alvin knows, I started teaching uh, extra courses at night at the University of California to pay for the film. So that's what I did when we'd come back for those three years uh, as I teach at night. And um, we were able to get it in the can. And the very first edit came out in... 2004, and then um, I took very sick with uh, what everyone thought was going to be a fatal case of cancer, but uh, in Mexico, they're just saying it's tough to kill a weed, which, uh, you know, is a good Calypso line, and and my dear friend, Lord Superior, uh, was diagnosed with the two, so we went through our Calypso battle together, and then came out of that, and in the next year or two, we cut it again and shot some more. Um, to complete the film. Cool. So, um, you know, I noticed that during the film, you know, there was an article uh, that was sent uh, really by Professor Daniel, and it was, um, it talked about, you know, obviously what we saw, a lot of those Calypsonians were aging. You know, was there an urgency to complete the film? And did you have anybody, you know, pass away? Or it was just like the perfect timing to do the film. It just, you know, the way you describe it, it sounds like things just fell into place and you were in the right place at the right time. No, that's, that's not quite true. Um, I would say that Kitchener's death really triggered us and uh, made me realize that it was time that we had to start active production for the film because, you know, we all, we all have projects we want to complete, right? and they get put on the back burner and to get them on the front burner for a film it's a difficult production a difficult task and uh coming from the united states with our equipment and everything added a degree a degree of difficulty to it and i know that we had contacted michael to uh, david to do an interview michael had contacted david to do an interview and uh we did the interview with david and it was just the greatest interview it's it's uh cut throughout the film and we just felt a need to get it done because the first year uh, uh kitchener died then pretender died then other people were dying people were getting sick and soupy and i got sick we knew we needed to get it done so that was the urgency I see. and of course and i i i want to point out that alvin was a critical force in the production of the film, uh, getting rights to the film, everything. He was our brother throughout. And Alvin, thank you for your effort and for being a brother throughout. And David uh, it has always been my uh, one of my favorite performers. And I, I still rarely miss, David, a uh, one of your Under the Trees performances when I'm there. Well, I never miss them. I never miss it, <laughs> if I believe me. And uh, I missed last year because we didn't go down, but looking forward to it again sometime. Okay, if I may put in my little two cents worth here. Um, I think it's very significant whether Jeffrey remembers the, the moment when we met. He, he seemed very frustrated because he wasn't getting what he wanted of for the film. He wanted to, to, to get the Calypsonians performing live. He wanted to get them talking. And I remember in discussion came up, is it possible to have four or five Calypsonians in a pub? The beginning of the film. Yeah, yeah. The street. 
And we set it up and it was magical. It was really, really something special. That was the genesis of the filming. Once we had got that under our belt, everything flowed from there. I took him up to Deluxe Cinema. We met Sandra, we met some other Calypsoonians and everything started to flow from there. And I always remember those couple first days with you, Jeffrey, because I am passionate about Calypso, as you know, from since birth. And I mean, just to know that there was somebody willing to document this, I was on board from day one. And I really enjoyed working on this documentary. It was an immediate bond. And I felt like I, I was uh, riding shotgun uh, to Alvin's in the driver's seat. And uh, they were magical times. I haven't seen the film since Soupy died, uh, which has now been a couple of years. And um, boy, it just brought back the, the life inside of, it was a Kaizo house at the Deluxe Cinema in the backyard in the parking lot uh, of being at Under the Trees when David performed, of our early interviews. It just was magical everywhere. And uh, it, the film made itself after that. I mean, it just, the, the talent and the beauty of these Kaisonians just came through. Uh, it was like a religious experience for me, I should say. It was very moving uh, at all times, even when it was difficult. Okay, um, you know, there's two questions that sparked from uh, our conversation. Uh, one is for Professor Daniel, just curious, you know, what is your, you know, you're a musician, but when you say since birth, what is it, your connection to the collective? No, I was born in a home where my father was like the village DJ. Oh. And I heard calypsos from age two, literally. And I could sing the calypsos. I didn't realize that many of the calypsos I was singing at the time had what they called double meanings. And I actually got in trouble in school for singing a calypso that had a <laughs> into it. But uh, I, I was attracted to it. To cut along, to take you quickly up at, at university, I sang calypso as part of the competitions they had at the university. And I won the crown one year. Believe it or not, Sparrow was one of the judges that year. So I feel very good about that, that he thought I was the winner. And um, throughout the years, I've more been a lyricist of Calypsos, a producer of Calypsos. Um, I have a knack for feeling lyrics when I hear a melody. And I like going in the studio and producing. I've managed artists along the way too. And then I had a uh, Calypso. Um, program called Calypso Showcase from 1992 to 2000. Over 300 programs that um, I, I did at that time, where I interviewed most people, including David Weller, <laughs> on more than one occasion. So True. that's my history. That's my background in, in Calypso. Okay. Wonderful. Well, this next question is for Mr. Rudder, and anyone can answer it. You know, uh, I learned a new term watching this film, and it's Kaiso. I never heard of Kaiso music. It's the predecessor of Calypso music. What is the difference? No difference. It's just uh, some people say Kaiso, some say Kaiso. Oh, know? it's, it's the same. It's really, it's really, it's, yeah, it's fluid. It's, fluid. it's like soca. You know, um, uh, soca is just a, a funkier version of Calypso. It's, you know, so. Uh, at the end of the day, it's the same. It's the same mother. They just have the children. They just have different names. Okay. The same, okay. same individual. Well, um, you know, I of course, you know, I went to Wikipedia, so it says, you know, that it's before Calypso, and you know, I had a conversation with Sandra, and she told me about something called uh, Cambule riots. So, you know, this was, you know definitely a point of entry for me, especially the resistance tradition within Calypso. And I think they touched on it in the film, how it was used to say things that they otherwise couldn't say. But could you guys like maybe right. share a little bit of your experience with that or those topics, Campbell A. Riots? You know, I could explain it or maybe it would be better if you guys explained it. Well, I know, I know a little bit about it, the Campbell A. Riots. We have to go back to, you know, the, the days of slavery and uh, the, in 1883, when the, they had what we call the Cambole riots, which 
the slave mass, the slavery, the slaves then they decided that they would mock some of the things that the masters were doing. They were having a carnival of sorts, actually. And so they did their way of expressing themselves and using the drum, which was actually banned after a while. And, you know, it, it was against the law to, to play a drum. And they sang the tunes in what we call patois, which is a combination of French and English, so that the masters would not understand what they were saying, because most of the time they were ridiculing their masters in song. So it, it, that's where the genesis of Calypso began, going into the late 19th century, into the early 20th century, when formerly from about 1911, um, if people like Lionel Velasco and so on started to take some form, which kept changing from decade to decade until it got into a really, really intricate type of form of expression. Interesting, interesting. And another uh, thing that, you know, I learned from Sandra too, this Campbell Day riots was just the beginning of how people began to assert Juve. You know, the carnival already existed. It was a French tradition. They had it in Europe. It was already going for centuries. And then they brought it over to the colonies. So then the part that's Juve is celebrated a different time of day earlier in the morning before people who would have been in the servant class would have had to go and wait on the Europeans during their carnival celebration. So that's what I understand to be the genesis of Juve, this uh, secret party or something that they were doing secretly playing drums earlier in the day before the carnival parades. David? With Calypso music. <laughs> Oh, I just, got, I just lost you guys for a while. I just got, got back on. Okay. So, so you know, you, you start mixing up a couple of things there because Juve, the develop, birth of Pan, development of Pan, and the growth of Calypso, all these things were happening together but at different eras. Right. And, but they were connected. And so you found that when Juve began, Calypso had begun in a sense at the same time because they were chanting in the streets and it used to be just one line chants sometimes. And when they got into the early part of the 20th century, 1910s, 1920s, it started to become like a four line type of, of um, expression, which then grew from there. But Jure was picking up, they parading through the streets. And the men, when they paraded through the streets, they used Tambu Bambu, which by 1930 morphed into the first pan. So you have to understand that all three of these idioms were coming together as a form of expression. Okay, okay. So Tambu Bambu is like a primitive steel pan. No, no. no. It's what just a pan? form of keeping a, a rhythm. Using okay. Bamboo to stamp on the ground or to. Bamboo. Right, bamboo, yes. Bamboo, bamboo. Bamboo, bamboo. <laughs> yes. The bamboo Kambule tree, actually, you know, yeah. cut pieces of lengths of bamboo and knock it together or something on the ground to get a rhythm. Some other time we will talk about that when we're dealing with pan and its birth. Yeah. And I can I hear Mr. Rudder saying. Did give a contribution there? Mr. Rudder was saying the cambule means sugar cane or burnt sugar. Right. Yes. So, cambule. Cane Bruni. <laughs> Kambule. All right. The cane, burnt cane. <laughs> All right. Um, cool. We'll have to have it again. The other point I want to make the, to follow up on this to the next era is that um, all of the performers in this film were born during um, colonial Trinidad and Tobago. So they were born into colonial times. And I would argue that in many ways, the era of Calypso that we cover in the film, because that's who's alive, that they wrote uh, the soundtrack for Trinidadian independence. And that Sparrow himself and his song, Gene and Dinah, which came out right at the time of that independence, represent the freedom from Britain um, and the British Empire. So it's also very much reflected of that spirit of independence 
um, that happened in the 50s and 60s and 70s. And then David comes in and explodes, explodes it with another uh, form of expression that I think also reflects a sense of independence. Mr. Rudder, can you talk, talk a little bit about your musical philosophy? My musical philosophy is simple. Tell okay. the stories. I've, I've been given the gift of telling the stories. So that's what I do. Um, you know, make people feel good about themselves, make them think, make them dance, make them reflect, you know, um, and that's, that's my mission. That's what, that's my gift. So that's, that's, that's what I do. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you mission. know, just through conversation with Sandra, you know, that what she explained to me that, you know, TNT, their carnival is a little bit ahead. And then those musicians could travel to the different islands, like almost like go on tour through the different islands to do the other carnival celebrations. So what was that experience like? Well, it's been going on for many years. Um, Trinidad was always the mecca of Calypso, of um, the Calypso culture, the mass culture in the Caribbean. Um, and, and over the years, I think it, it's, it's also a very, econ it's about economics also. A lot of the islands realized that, oh, Trinidad is doing this and making, making tons of money having you know, a good exposure in the, world, in, the world, in the world of tourism and so on. So um, maybe we should do it too, you know? And I think a lot of, a lot of the countries now have adapted, uh, adopted Calypso, the whole Calypso carnival culture, you know? Um, we, we all share, like a lot of, a lot of our youngsters uh, play dance hall, a lot of young Jamaicans play soca, you know? So it's a, it's a, it's a way to cross to, to, to sort of link the Caribbean together. We had um, two different uh, markets one time, CARICOM and CARIFTA, which is a political level, trying to, to, people are trying to unify the Caribbean as one people. And we are doing it easily with, with music. CARIFTA and, and, and CARICOM, they did okay, but they didn't, they didn't succeed as much as music and the culture has, you know? Mm. Interesting. Well, you know, thank you for that. Um, you know, my perception of you is very humble uh, from what I've heard. You know, you were turning out the hits. You know, we heard your latest, Welcome to Trinidad, but I heard that you had many, many hits. Uh, St. Anne's Girl, no, St. Anne's, Bahia Girl, The Hammer. You know, what's it like being loved by everyone? Can you tell us? <laughs> Can't tell what's, us that. <laughs> what's it like being loved? Hey, it's a great... It's a great feeling, you know? <laughs> you can't get better than that. <laughs> okay. So, let me say so. David brought, brother, brought to Calypso a new depth, a new style of composing, delivery, and communication with his audience that was missing. Sparrow was great and he was flamboyant and he was everything. But David brought a new level of intellectual, if you want to call it, um, presentation and input and composition that was missing at that time. And it, it almost took Calypso to a different level, a higher level. Wonderful, wonderful. So, you know, once again, like I said, I'm a tourist in your culture. So, I, you know, I'm asking you guys questions. It is colored by my experience. So what I saw in this documentary, I saw very, a lot of parallels to like hip hop, my experience with uh, growing up yeah. listening to hip hop in the United States. And I'll just throw them, just run them down. Uh, the extempo, the extemporaneous uh, lyrics making remind me of freestyling. Um, another thing that I saw uh, is the, you know, women in hip hop versus women in Calypso, where there's this morality being imposed on women that's not necessarily, men are not constrained by that same morality. But, uh, you know, you guys can answer those questions or whatever speaks to you, you know, I'm willing to listen. But those are two very clear parallels I saw with hip hop and Calypso. And you guys have your political movement and then also a pop movement as well. I would argue that there are direct links between uh, Calypso and hip hop and that the young immigrants coming out of the Caribbean who did ex, uh, expen extempo, that, that tradition flew right into hip hop. 
um, it, they are one and the same. They're coming from the same neighborhoods uh, that in New York City, in Toronto, and elsewhere, uh, England. Um, and there's one other point I wanted to make about David before we go into that, now that he's back on. My memory is... Oh, yeah. that, that, you're back, brother. I'm, I'm making a point about you, and you can follow up with it. Alvin talked about David being bringing a whole new level of depth to Calypso lyrics, Calypso meaning. I would also, he also did it musically as well. But my memory is, and you can watch this on YouTube. This is, a, we started this film before YouTube. So now you can see all this, a lot of things on YouTube that you couldn't see before. But if you go to YouTube and you watch David's performance, my memory is it was the 1986 De Manche Gras. Uh, at Queens Park, Savannah, that David does the hammer, and was it Bahia Girl? Yes. 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 Thank you. It was stunning. It is, to me, one of the great moments in musical history, and um, and he's going up against Stalin, who I think won it before and after, and who does this performance the following year of Burn Them. It just was an incredible period in Calypso music that I would argue was transformative. Alvin, I think yeah, that, that period of 86, 87, those two years, it was like only two people in competition. Yeah. The, the, the level of, you know, of trying to outdo the other one was in, remarkable. And, uh, you know, as a person who I used to adjudicate in those days at the preliminary yeah. level, and then I would work on television for the finals. And people would be bombarding me. Who's going to win? Who's going to win? I said, who wants it on the night? And I think in 86, David wanted it. And in 87, <laughs> it was the opposite. You know, it was just that little edge of putting a little bit, something more into the pot to make sure that you come out on top. But it was very close. So what's the judging criteria? Like, is it the song? Is it the lyrics? Is it the it's everything. It's everything. It's everything. <laughs> <laughs> Melody, lyrics, presentation, rendition, originality, and audience reaction, which is not on the score sheet, but which plays a big part. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. It's so. It's uh, David, uh, uh, when you were off, what we what I I, I just mentioned that I see uh, parallels with hip hop in the states to calypso, you know, in terms of extempo, and then in terms of uh, women, you know, the the I don't want to say treatment, I I don't know what word I'm looking for, but just in terms of the you know with the women in hip hop, I said that basically, and you know, I will address this to everybody because you know, maybe I didn't hear the real Calypso. Maybe all I heard was Harry Belafonte and I'm not really knowing what's up. It seemed like it's kind of dirty a little bit. What was going on? Like, was it a little bit explicit lyrics? Like, what's going on? Why was this such a, what was the you know, Calypso, Cal going on? <laughs> yeah, Cal Calypso music is like, like a hip, hip, hip hop's mother. Okay. Um, the, the whole, the whole, uh, what we call extempo, fighting each other with words. Um, you know, it's a little more streamlined and, and mel melodic, whereas, whereas hip hop is spoken. But it's basically the same, same, same challenges, lyrical challenges, and the same treatment of women. So it's it's um it's something it's it's a way to read society. Uh, in, in this case, I think it's like reading the the, the whole uh, middle passage society of African people. You know how different people, Brazil, Haiti, Trinidad, America. How, how we look at our women, why we look at, at, at things in a certain way, why we, we take up our vocal challenges against each other, you know? It's part of that whole, that whole it's, it's, it's different variation of the same, same, the same culture, you know? Mm -hmm. we, as Stalin mm -hmm. said, we, we made the same trip on the same ship. We just manifest it in different ways in the society that shaped us then, you know? Mm -hmm. But it's still mm -hmm. the story of the Middle Passage. Gotcha. Well, thank you for that. I'm going to take uh, some questions from the audience. Those are the end of my questions. Uh, did Harry Belafonte ever end up going to Trinidad? So that's an audience question. No, 
Not that um, I know of. <laughs> let, let me let me tell you how we did, and I, I that that's a great question. The interview with Belafonte was probably the toughest interview I ever did, because he knew we were coming from uh, Trinidad and had real leanings toward uh, Trinidadian Calypso, and he is also a brilliant man and a and a a critical American activist for 60 years. He has been on the right side of justice here for 60 years. That's right. In Trinidad, um, people spoke like the he teeth the music. He, he, he knows it. He joked about it. Okay. And I, I want it, to, it's, it's great. We have this, this group here because, you know, in the film, um, Chokta says, uh, he put a, a little water in the brandy, right? Water. <laughs> and it's and people and some people like water in the brandy, and some people like it straight. And then David says, which is the way we end that section. Yeah, people say this about him and all that, but no one has put calypso music into the consciousness of the world more than he has. So we use that as the concluding comment there. And that was probably the toughest choice we dealt with. Really, it was it, to think about this. And the great thing is, because of that, Belafonte saw the film, liked the film, loved the film. But he understood some of the issues more. So the way he went to Trinidad was by watching the film. And the way the Trinis got to, they got to hear his version of the story for the first time in the film. So I feel like some of that chasm between has been healed because of this film. And I think part of it was healed because of what David said. Uh, and it was a very wise observation 20 years ago that he made and it's even more true today. So um, I feel good about that, about the film, that it helped to heal that riff a little bit. Yeah, that was a poignant moment in the film. Um, I have another audience. Thank you. I have another audience question. How useful is it to discuss the advent of Soka and what some consider to be the decline of Calypso? Is it like trying to distinguish one cup of water from the other in the same stream? Well, go for it. Um, I always say Soka is Calypso. That's the easy answer. However, when you get into the musicality of it, there are certain rhythmic enhancements that make Soka more attractive from a party point of view than straight Calypso. And that is where the, the subtle difference is. Is Calypso dying? No. It may not be seen or heard as, let us say, expansively as it should be. But there will always be commentary. And even when people sing what we call soca, there is always an underlying message, which is basically the whole objective of Calypso. So as far as I'm concerned, Calypso is still very much alive. It may be packaged a little differently, but that's my feeling. Well, the way, the way I do this is like this. I say, Calypso is this. Doom, 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 And so guys, doom, 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 It's just, it's just a danceable version, variation of the music, you know? And, you know, going back to the Harry Belafonte thing, I, I, look, I, I check the people misunderstand the, the social impact of the Calypso lyric, you know, in society. But Maya Angelou, Farrakhan, all these people who were, who were very outspoken Americans, they grew up, it's Calypso culture, they grew up in Maya's father's at Philadelphia. They all grew up in the Calypso culture. So that, that and, and, and up to, even up to today, you know, Farrakhan is still firing, still, still, he's, he's like he's speaking, every time I see him speak, it's like he's talking Calypso, you know? 
So the, that that is something that people, um, you know, when they, when they think about, we have a, we have a, we have this idea that we have to preserve everything we have. And don't let the other people see it. You know, it's ours. But the way you, sh you, 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 sh you, when you share your gift, that's when you get the rewards, you know? And um, so I feel that everybody who embraced the Calypso from when, when, whatever era is part of that history and the power of the music, you know, the power of the passage, the middle passage, and how we have managed to cope with this, this, this injustice, you know? So, you know, I just wanted to make that point. Okay, thank you. I have another audience question. Uh, can David tell of early carnival memories, his Belmont, Port of Spain route? Yeah. Well, I, I grew up in Belmont, which is like, I would say if, 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 if Trinidad was like New York, Belmont would be Brooklyn. <laughs> so anyway, but um, Belmont was a cultural, I, I call it a university. It's called, it was originally called Freetown, you know, where the free slaves, uh, built this this is the society that is now to, to called Belmont. But um, we had the most steel bands, Calypsonians, artists, you know, um, Sandra's uncle, Ken Morris, one of the one of Trinidad's great artists, came out, out, all over, out of Belmont. People passed, everybody in Trinidad had to pass through Belmont at some point in their life, you know? So that's the kind of place, it's like a, it was a living university. Derek Walcott, you know, um, George, the great George, writer from Barbados, George Lamming, they all cut their teeth in Belmont, you know, and, and that's just to, to touch the surface because if, if we start to talk about Belmont right now, we we'll probably be talking for, for the rest of the evening. <laughs> but it's, it's um, still a very powerful place. And, um, you know, when the history of this trailer is written, the, one, of, one of the major parts of the, that book is always about, about Belmont. Cool. Um, I have two more audience questions. Uh, the first one is how can or how are Calypsonians using this time in online media to bring music to the world? Who is figuring the technology to make it happen? And is this a new opportunity for those who are maybe finding it difficult to travel? I can put a little bit, yeah. Um, we have a couple of people who are exploiting the online thing. Um, we have a radio station called WAC. They've been doing a lot to present some of the Calypsonians in concert on a regular basis. And um, they use a medium called Fund Me TNT to get some donations, which is, has been quite uh, um, well funded uh, so that the Calypsonians can make something while they cannot perform live as it were. That has even extended into some people having what they call virtual all-inclusive parties, whatever that is. But it's an opportunity for them. What I, what I find is that they are not really understanding what virtual offers to the Calypsonian. Because one of the biggest problems that Trinidadian Calypsonians have is they tend to see Trinidad and Tobago as their audience. And because of the virtual situation, all of a sudden, the world, they have the potential now to, to, to offer themselves to the world. And they have to use the technology that is available. I mean, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, these are all available to market yourself. And this is what is needed. Um, I'd say that much because I really feel very uh, passionate about the fact that people are not using the opportunities that this time presents to them. Yeah, I'd like to say that um, I'm a techno peasant, but because I've been helping putting my music online, in this time I haven't, I haven't done a job for the last 11 months, but I get a check every month from, from my royalties, which is keeping me going, you know? So that's living proof that get, get, get with this program, get with the system and um, this one, this is one of the good things when you write good songs. All my old songs are bringing in money to me right now, and, and, and I can keep my family, you know, intact. You know, so you gotta do what you gotta do, gotta do, you know? do it well, and you, you get the rewards. 
That's great. That's 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 a great um that's a great perspective. Um I have a question and then there are more audience question. I just um uh, so you know Dor I've never been to Carnival, you know, so I'm just gonna take it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Well, let, me, let me say this. Sandra's going to take you. <clears throat> you. You should go down um, with Alvin as the tour guide. And I have to say, no one, no one who ever goes to Trinidad cur during Carnival should miss David in Under the Trees at the Normandy. At the Normandy. It, is, it is a religious experience. Yeah. Not only do you get up on your feet, but you feel like you're like four feet, four or five feet above the ground. What is under the trees? I, I heard you guys say, what is that? It's a club? It's a bar? What is a pub? What is under the trees? It's an outdoor it's venue it's a, at the okay. Normandy Hotel. Okay, okay, okay. And there it's is a, a bar there. Big yard. Okay, big yard. Okay, cool. Uh, so, you know, I have a question. Are there other genres of music that play during these parades, or is it like only soca or calypso like do you see a day no. when they would integrate outside or foreign music no. for carnival <laughs> no the I only have, time you would hear foreign Why? music or classical music is on yeah. the time but yes yeah. so a calypso tempo i hear you okay that's good that's good i'm just checking just checking <laughs> and <laughs> Because you never know, you know, you never know. It's good to hear actually foreign music played on the pan in a calypso beat. Mm -hmm. And that, that is very attractive to a lot of the locals and foreign. Yeah, there's also something that's growing in electronic music with, with, a, soak, with a calypso feel, you know, mm -hmm. um, it, it's, that's growing also. So it's, it's, it's always, it's all embracing now, you know, kids are different, mm -hmm. different so songs. A lot, a lot of the, um, the music of Africa, Nigeria, you know, um, Burna Boy and all these guys. You know, you're feeling that kind of soca. They, they, they're actually playing soca, but we don't yeah. call it something else, you know? Oh, yeah. I, met, I went to Jamaica. We met Sarani. Sarani has a song with Burna Boy, and that's my jam. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had a great time. So uh, what was I going to tell you guys? Um, so what I'm getting is that it's a living music. You know, you guys are integrating the foreign music, the modern music, the classic music. It's a living music. It's not like Calypso is just music from, you know, 1920 to 1960. Like I had a messed up perception of yeah. what it was. Calypso is a kind of like, like, like a mother music. It, it, it's like it's an amoeba. It draws in uh, um, and other forms and, and kind of comes and becomes a new version of Calypso. Because if you listen to Calypso back in the 1920s, 20s, 30s, it's songs like Rap Time. There was a Latin era, Latin period where a lot of it's Sparrow would sing with Maria and Blakey would sing with Maria. And Dung, you know. And that kind of Latin vibe. Um, so, so, soca came out in the early late sixties, early seventies. We were listening to, to, to soul music from from the US, you know. And listen to the last poets, uh, Marvin Gaye, or the whole Motown feel, you know. So and then, so, so then there's a marriage between the calypso and the soca and, and the soul music. That's how we got the word soca, soul, calypso. Mm -hmm. You know, after wow. all things change, people started to, to give it, but that, that was the genesis of everything. You know, if you listen to the, the very first song that, that, that signaled the, the change of, of the soca music, was where Shorty, Endless Vibration, where he says, change the accent mm -hmm. of Carnival mm -hmm. to a groovy, groovy canal. Music so bad, fuss your hip, rock your boat, rock your boat. Rock oh, your yeah. Boat. Can Big time. <laughs> <laughs> it's too bad. I felt it. If you if you don't dance on soca, I don't know what to tell you. I have one last audience question, and this one is for Dr. Dunn. Are there any plans, and Professor Daniel, are there any plans to do an updated version of Calypso Dreams? An updated, we'll let the next generation of filmmakers do that. Um, I think there is a great documentary to be made right now. One of the things that to me that's happening in Trinidad is that Carnival has also become a place where gender tensions are worked out, okay? And I think that women have really asserted themselves in, in this generation of, of soca performers. Um, they are always contesting for the crown, for road march. They are a dominant force in contemporary uh, Trinidadian soca. And... Oh, really? 
the, so I, I, that's, I think that would be a great documentary. Um, I don't know if I got it in me to make that one, but that would be great. There, I'd also like to point out something here, use this opportunity. Sandra, it's nice to meet you. <laughs> we, this is the first time we've got to really chat and see each other. And I want to thank you for all you've done to keep the film alive in the last several months. Grateful. Use it however, whenever you want. I also know that a couple of people who were very important to the film were on today watching. And two of them were the Trot sisters, Elisa and Maya, doctors, professors, who helped tremendously with the film. And also Carla Fodderingham uh, in, in Trinidad, um, who says hello to Alvin and David. Uh, was watching today, and I want to thank her for all her critical assistance, uh, as well as all the people whose names were in the credits. So I, I thank them for that. So thank you. I'd just like to mention that I know for a fact that Jeffrey has a ton load of footage which is not in the film, and which can create a series of even shorter length documentaries. Okay. Which will be worth seeing. One is just the interplay between Sparrow and um, Superior, which. Well, oh, that's in the Glamour Boys again. The Glamour Boys again. That but there are a lot of other, foot, uh, other things that happen along the way that, uh, that we, we documented, which I am sure we can look at different angles to create, uh, you know, small documentaries, 15, yeah. 20 minutes maybe, but I'm it needs to be seen. Well, you talked about the day we met, okay? The Good Times Pub on Henry Street. Correct. We could do the, the entire thing. <laughs> well, I'm gonna, I am gonna cut one of that in honor of you, Alvin, uh, you. with Relator and, and the rest of the crew, and Blakey uh, and Conqueror. It's a brilliant scene, and uh, I will do that in honor of you, so thank you. Um, you know, I, think, I think there's a great one to be made of David. Um, I had, we had a, 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 a shoot, we shot David at uh, an Under the Trees, absolutely brilliant performance. So if you ever want that done, David, just get a hold of someone and we'll get it done for you. Great, great, great hospital. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'd, it, like, I'd like to say, don't waste a moment in trying to get it done. I don't. I survived cancer. I'm good, girl. It scares me. You know, there's a lot of people passing away, and we keep thinking, okay, I'll do this, I'll do that, and then the time goes by, it does get done, so don't waste a moment. We we have the historians here. We have young filmmakers coming up who may want to, um, you know, join you in terms of manifesting uh, the film, because I know making movies are very hard <laughs> you know, I used to be a former filmmaker and you got it but I, I would be happy to bring fil young filmmakers together to assist you in getting it done and of course in Trinidad there are a lot of videographers I you know I don't know a lot of them but I do know a lot of them here like of like Mario Layton, uh, Rob Lee and you know um, Ricardo those guys they're they're they have background Caribbean backgrounds they're here and they can help you know to make this come true because it's our it's our mandate it's our duty to 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 get it together and leave a legacy I'm here to help and support in any way and and provide any footage um, we're gonna talk we, we'll talk about that later but it's there and as Alvin says um, I think we shot 70 hours and what you saw was an hour of it. And uh, there's some real gold in what didn't get included. And uh, there is, I, I wasn't joking. There's a brilliant performance by David um, as well. And I, I think he's worthy of a, of, of a documentary of his own. Of course. You agree with me that Sandra? Oh, I agree. And listen, um, I just have to tell you a little bit, of, a little bit of, uh, history. I, I met David uh, at uh, my uncle's, well, I used to live there too, at 107B Belmont Circular Road. And David was there working with my uncle Ken, who like the most famous of all the, the, the Morrises. 
and nobody knew that David could sing or get on the stage. You understand? He was, David doesn't talk much, okay? He's very quiet and he was very shy. Am I, am I telling the truth, David? <laughs> yes, Everybody would be shouting and carrying on, but David would be there, not saying a word, doing his metal work because he was an apprentice of my Uncle Ken, uh, it, you know, doing all the copper work and things like that. Not a word. And David, I need you to tell them a little bit of the story of how everybody got to know that you could sing, that you could I could even talk, much less sing. So, <laughs> yeah. Okay, we ready. I can't remember you, you being my kind of. I can't remember the moment that I, I you do like a sing. Yeah, we're having a little bit of delay. Yeah, we're having yeah. a little bit of delay, yeah, delay. in your, your audio. Well, Sandra, I'll tell you a story while we're waiting for him because I want to hear it. I was going through some old footage and I said, there's David singing in, in the chorus in the background. <laughs> He was one of the best chorus singers that you could find. He's back up you know, a lot. You think and so? He would work in the studios, backing up most of the calypso. We, we were the yeah. We were the go-to singers at, at that time. Carl, Carl Carl Jacobs, Carl Jacobs, and Patsy Holder and David Weller. That, well, that, that Carl was the, that was the foursome. Well, Carl told me some of those stories, and I also want to thank Carl. And if you talk to him. He allowed us to throw Lord Superior's 80th birthday at his place, Kaiser Blues, and he just turned it over to us. And it was one of the great uh, performances I've ever seen. It was a great lineup, and um, Carl was a great host. And then afterwards, when we were breaking down, I got to talk to him at length about your early days with him, etc. cetera. So uh, Kaiser still lives in Port of Spain. Oh, yes. Sandra, yeah. I can't. I yeah. can't remember what you're talking about here. You, you can't. <laughs> no, it I was can't. that long ago. Oh my god! <laughs> Listen, nobody knew this. This young man could even talk because he barely said anything. <laughs> he just did his work and was looking at and absorbing everything going around him. And I believe. Uh, my, what my uncle said, oh, David invited us to come and some show he is in. And there's David on stage. Hey, what, 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 what David doing on stage? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, he really gave us a big surprise. And they can't stop talking about the, this young man who was so shy, who didn't say a word while everybody was making a big bacchanal. He was just so quiet. And there he I'm is sorry, on I'm stage. Sorry. <laughs> oh, we, we're losing yeah. you. I can't hear you. That's, I don't know. He's going crazy over here, but. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, Mr. Rudder. We can't hear you. What is he saying? I was just going to say thank you all so much for this. I mean, uh, I feel so passionate about the cult here whether it's Calypso, Pan, anything to do with Trinidad culture. It's a great opportunity to clear up some of the misconceptions that people have about the art form. And uh, more of this needs to be done now that we have the world listening and watching. This is the time to use your money. And I want to endorse something that David said late, earlier. I've actually made more money out of copyright since <laughs> COVID came on the scene than than before because like david i have a lot of music out there on itunes you know fine tunes all over the world and i'm and you know i say this to the trinidadians who might be listening i'm getting hits from songs that i did the lyrics for from 1972. wow i'm still getting a dollar every now and again wow. from places like australia japan china switzerland europe all over Europe, all over the Caribbean and United States. The, the, the technology is there to be embraced and utilized. This is the message I'd like to leave. 
to those who are listening. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, on that note, I'm going to uh, close it out. Are there any other things anyone wants to say or share? I, I, I'm aware. I know that uh, Sandra is a carnival queen. I don't know if she wants to talk about that or maybe another time. But yeah, I heard she won an award. I did hear that through the grapevine. But um, more that is one. <laughs> I have to say more than one because, you know, I put in the work. <laughs> I know, that's right. And we saw that in the slideshow uh, before the film. But I just want to thank you guys so much. Thank you, Dr. Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Rudder. Thank you, Professor Daniel. And thank My you, pleasure. Sandra. Thank you, Sadiq Asylum. This has just been tremendous. Um, really just eye-opening experience for me. And I hope that everyone was able to take something from it. And I'm so proud that we can continue to celebrate our culture and you know uplift our ancestors using this medium, the digital medium. So I, I just think it's really an amazing time. It, it's it's a bittersweet time because, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, sad things are happening. And every day I'm, somebody's telling me somebody died for whatever reason. I don't know if it's because we're just trapped in the house or what. So, you know, these moments of light, I really look forward to this. And I just want to thank you all for sharing this moment with me, with Sandra, with everyone here in this panel. And um, have a great night. Thank you. Okay, Jeff. Yes. Brother. Thank you, David. Stay warm, David. <laughs> you too. Okay, Before we leave, uh, I'd like you to know that we are going to have more films uh, in February. Uh, what is that date? Uh, it's February 21 and March 14th. Look out. We will send the notice to you. If you're, if you're registered tonight, you will get an email. So thank you very much for coming and uh, join us again in February and March. Thank yes. you, and thank you, See Abby, you. for okay. coordinating this. Okay. <laughs> thank you very much. I'm excited. I'm ready <laughs> for the world. <laughs> and our luta continua, in the words of Severia, the struggle continues. So. The struggle continues. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Thank you.